you. Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. This is episode 151 for April 21st, 2011. I'm Ryan Trout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm a normal-looking Josh Walworth. And I'm Al Valentano, and Josh, where's the Bacardi? I was thinking that, you know, it's 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 151. Instead, I've only got alcohol that's 10% by volume. That's still pretty good, especially for a beer. So yeah, it's, on it's a one pint. <laughs> uh, today, today's episode of the PC Perspective Podcast is a very special episode, uh, and that is because the icon, the logo that you see behind me, that's been here for I don't know a hundred episodes or so, uh, that has <laughs> never matched anything you've ever seen on the PC Perspective website. Uh, today actually matches the logo that you see on the PC Perspective website. Now, the other three fine young gentlemen on this podcast uh, will know how long this has been in development. We're going to keep that fact a secret uh, because it's kind of embarrassing. Josh had hair at that point. <laughs> long, long time ago. I don't ago. think I was hired on. 1974 yeah. then. Okay. Something, yeah. yeah. Um, so yes, it's very it's 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 exciting for us. We have a brand new website. There's still kinks to work out. There's still some things that need to be tweaked in terms of formatting and then content naming and this type of thing. Uh, but we highly encourage you if you're not on uh, you're not watching us on the video version, which most of you are not. If you're listening to the audio version, make sure you go to pcper.com and see what has changed. Um, there is a a news post floating around there on the front page called "Welcome to Soliciting Feedback and Comments." Uh, we realize it's not perfect. We realize that there are some things that are we're going to want to change. Font size being one of them. Kind of adjusting and tweaking a couple of other little things. Um, what we will do in the interim, and we have basically since the site launched after we recorded last week's podcast, just the next day, have pretty much been working nonstop. Uh, behind the scenes to get things up and running. Been teaching all these new guys a new CMS system, um, and they have been uh, very welcoming to it. Hopefully, um, we will get the news pumping out and the reviews pumping out again very soon. To celebrate the launch of this new site, I hope everyone that's listening um, will go to the site, and you'll see contests going on. Presently, as we record this, there is a giveaway of a Thermaltake Challenger Ultimate Gaming keyboard on the site um we're actually giving away two of those all you have to do is make a comment on that news post and you are entered it doesn't really get any easier than that uh, if you're not familiar with the keyboard it's pretty cool looking um as i say in the description does it have a backlight check onboard audio jacks and usb ports yep a fan for your sweaty palms yes sir <laughs> <laughs> And it, does. Fan, and it does. The fans pointed the wrong way for Josh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, I, but okay. No, but anyway. um, so depending on when you're listening to this podcast, that contest might be over. We've been doing one giveaway every day for the last few days. It started with OCZ, gave away a 120 gig Vertex 2 SSD. The second one was we had a pair of Corsair Hydro Series H60 water coolers we gave away. Uh, we have other prizes coming up. We have a pair of Corsair headphones we're going to give away. We have a pair of Thermaltake headphones. We have a set of Corsair speakers. We have another Vertex SSD and a new, um, I, I think it might be a not yet released Asus motherboard, Intel platform motherboard. So all of those will be kind of, I'm basically doing one a day unless I get drunk and forget. Uh, then the might one night last two days, but enter a comment. We pick a winner, ship out the prizes, all good stuff, all to celebrate you guys continuing to read our site and uh, leave comments and feedback for us on all that cool stuff that's going on. So, which uh, which uh, course our speakers are they? Are they twenty two hundreds or twenty five? Twenty five hundreds. Twenty five. Wow, that's that's a big prize. Yeah, Corsair Literally. stepped up big. Corsair stepped up yeah. big. So speakers, two headphones. The people who win the headphones will get to choose if they want the USB or the analog versions. Ooh. And uh, two Hydro H60s, which uh, one of them is, we actually have an H50 and an H60 in the, our video editing rig. This is kind of what we had sitting around the, the office. So water cooling on both of those processors in there. So that's kind of cool. Did you guys get um, the uh, other cooler working? Uh, yes, eventually, uh, yes. It, it finally made contact with the processor. 
Ah, yes, they, that's what's required they, for cooling. <laughs> these they weren't really made for this style of motherboard. This is not an MAT. It's not an EATX. It's I, I can't remember the, the the form factor of the board, but it's it's not meant to fit in this chassis. It's not meant for these coolers. But we made it go because, quite frankly, I don't that's have any other kicks. The way you roll. For for our listeners, yeah. I'm guessing it was the uh, dual Xeon board that Ryan's putting together over there that has uh, like um, threaded inserts on the motherboard for the yes yeah for the CPU coolers yeah right and uh, the threads one of the threads on the on the post that came with the H60 did was was kind of uh, was stripped and so it, it it was a long story basically we turned it on and one processor was running at 32 Celsius and it was like 92 Celsius that was a problem turned it off fixed it. No big deal. We're up and running now. So uh, we're very excited about the new site. Please go check it out. Let us know what you think. If you if you want to send comments to me directly, you can. My email, uh, ryan at pcper.com works, rshrout at pcper.com. You can send it to podcast at pcper.com. All that kind of stuff still works. If you find any problems, links that you think should work that don't anymore, um, don't worry. The SSD decoder is still there. It needs some updating, I think, right, Alan? But it's still there. Yes, it's uh, we ported it over, but it's still a little. It's not where I want it to be yet. All right, and we got the podcast up there. Jeremy got the hardware leaderboard all worked out. Uh, if you're a forum member, you'll notice if you go to the forum still as of today, they are still on the old style. Hopefully, within Saturday or Sunday time frame, that will be changed over as well, and we will be good to go. So there you go. I guess that's enough of intrasite politics. What do you guys say we talk about graphics cards for just a second? No. This is, are they well, super expensive? I, no. No, these are I, far, I want to talk about the site more and how much I have not posted as of yet. Yeah, you, you notice. That's right. Everybody who's listening or watching, uh, make sure you comment to Josh's email address, jwalrath at pcper.com. And my social security number is... Um, <laughs> Okay, Ryan's is 319-789372. I don't know what state that's from, but it's not Kentucky. Okay. Um, so let's talk about graphics cards. But no, Jeremy, they are not expensive graphics cards. These are budget graphics cards. Um, typically not very exciting. We talked about sexy GPUs. We're talking about, uh, you know, earlier in the month, last month we talked about the 6990 and the GTX 590, these are dual GPU cards that are $500, $600, things like that. Um, really kind of outrageously priced. But uh, what what sells the most? Uh, probably cards like these guys. Uh, a little bit a little bit smaller, a little bit tinier. Uh, Half-height PCBs. You know, it's been a while since I've seen one, a ribbon like this on, on a PC. You know, it always makes me think of the old COM port connections on PC chips, motherboards that you had, used to have to route and that type of stuff. Lord help us, those were awful days. Um, the cards specifically are a new a new smaller chip in the Radeon HD 6000 series, the HD 6670 and 6570. These are Turks is the code name for the GPU, T-U-R-K-S. Um, I guess a little bit about the GPU itself. It is a 40 nanometer. It's based on the BART's architecture, which I didn't really have initially in the article, and I went back and added some uh, information on that after Josh asked me that very same question. Uh, it's, you know, it's a 40 nanometer part, DirectX 11 capable, obviously, uh, 716 million transistors, 480 stream processors. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of computing power, because I believe the 6870 has, mm, what is that, 1600 stream processors? Is that 6870? Right? No, it's like uh, 1130 something, and the yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. 6850 is nine something something. Okay, something. we're off the even numbers now. That's right. I forgot. Yeah. So, um, so much harder these days. It is. It is. The the the, the performance on them is kind of where you're going to what you're going to expect. Um, the the 6670 and the 6570 are the same GPU. The only difference is in the clock speed, uh, 650 megahertz versus 800 megahertz. And in, uh, the memory clocks will probably be near the same 1 gigahertz speeds if you get the GDDR5 variants. Keep in mind that if you're looking at a 6570 for a budget graphics card for a home theater PC or something like that, um, keep in mind that there are two models, the GDDR5 memory model and the DDR3 memory model, um, and there's significant difference. 64 gigs per second memory bandwidth versus 28, 28 gigs 
per second memory bandwidth. So um, performance on those is going to be significantly different, even at, at, the, at this low resolution or this low of performance. Um, you can see pictures of the reference cards on the website. It doesn't really matter. These cards aren't going to be sold in a reference format. If we look at the benchmarks comparisons, what's interesting is the 6670 is supposed to retail for $99. That is this card. It's got a, you ever seen a, a small half height PCI or half height uh, PCB with a dual slot cooler on it before? Doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, what especially brand if, is that cooler? Uh, it is reference brand. It doesn't say ATI on it? Oh, no. This one actually says Radeon on it. Oh, okay. uh, one of them, one of my had. It looks like they had some extra plastic because uh, uh, this card actually says. So, question for you, Ryan. Yeah. Did that board come with an extra adapter plate that was half height for the rear? No, the the reference cards don't. Um, but the retail ones would, right? So yeah. they're they're sending these basically for testing. These aren't going to be sold like this. But yeah, the idea is what you're going to get is with a half height PCB, you're going to get the half height. Uh, uh, bracket that you can install, so you know one U systems, home theater systems, that type of thing. That's that's the idea. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and it's we've seen these types of cards before. This is just an iteration on, say, the fifty six or the fifty five hundred series of graphics cards, which you know were the same market segment, performance segment for last generation's parts. Uh, the sixty six seventy is going to run you ninety nine bucks. Sixty five seventy. Seventy nine dollars and the sixty four fifty, which is our, is the the lowest price card. I think it's like fifty five dollars, something like that. We're gonna have another review on that sometime soon too. Um, long story short, the performance of these cards is not out of this world as you would expect, but they're they're able to do ten eighty p gaming um, relatively decently at modest quality settings for most games, which sounds like a a long-winded way of saying they suck as gaming cards, but it's not that they do. You know, most of the people, a lot of the benchmarking that even you'll see from AMD and NVIDIA cards at this resolution are 1680 by 1050, sometimes even 1366 um, uh, by 768, those types of things, because this is the the low-cost, the low-cost segment. The problem for AMD in this case was... Not that these were underperformers. They, they beat the 5600 and the 5500 series cards. Um, but the competition from AMD's older cards and NVIDIA's older cards is, is pretty interesting because if you look at something like this, uh, this is a, a, a GTA, GTS 450 from Galaxy. Um, and you, you'll, first thing you'll notice is that this is a much larger card than this. I mean, they're just, they're just, they're just bigger, beefier cards, um, and the the GTS 450s require a six pin power connection. The 6670s and the 6570s do not require a power connection, and that that comes out when you look at the power consumption numbers. The 6670 uses about 50 watts less power than the GTS 450, so. Uh, that that kind of uh, tells us why you need the power connector on one and not the other. Gaming performance wise, the GTS 450 beats it pretty handily, and even AMD's own Radeon HD 5770, which is also a larger card like this and requires a six-pin power adapter, beats it out in terms of perf- 550. Now the 450, this this GTS 450 from Nvidia, you can find um, for about 105 to 110 dollars. And if you look for it on sale, you can get it for ninety ninety five bucks. So, if you look at it strictly at a gaming performance level, these these new AMD cards, the six thousand sixty six and sixty five series cards, have trouble standing up against the previous generation cards that are on sale that are lower priced that have dipped down. Um, but I'm curious, to me, somebody who's looking to buy this card isn't necessarily out for gaming performance. They're out more for what features you get, maybe noise levels and power consumption because you're going to put it in a home theater PC. Maybe you're looking for a Sapphire or a power color option that's going to to run passively even. Um, but maybe maybe for that consumer that is does have integrated Intel graphics on their you know Core i5 
eight something or the, you know they're, they're using integrated graphics from Intel, whether it be Lin or uh, Clarkdale or the new Sandy Bridge that they just want to upgrade. If if that's the case, it makes sense to spend the ninety nine bucks on Nvidia's GTS four fifty or AMD's Radeon HD fifty seven seventy as opposed to these cards that while more efficient and perhaps quieter are are going to run about thirty percent slower frame rates. So. Uh, it, it's an interesting thing. We've seen this with a lot of graphics card releases where uh, take NVIDIA's GTX 550 Ti, a good card in its own right compared against the brand new parts also from in, uh, from AMD. But if you compared it to its previous generation GTX 460, 768 megs, uh, 768 meg cards, it priced the same. The performance was much better on the older generation card. And we're just seeing this cycle where uh, we have, I think we're at the point where there's too much compression in these different price segments. Um, I mean, if if you look on Newegg and you say, show me other cards between $50 and $110, I bet there's hundreds of them available. Uh, oh, hundreds. Easy. Hundreds. 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 Of, um, which you got to get rid of the Ds when you're talking about hundreds of them. It's, 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 like a, it's one of those, it's a good problem to have, but if you're... If you're a worrisome consumer, always worried about not getting the best deal, you, you might be stuck in that limbo where you never actually purchase anything. Or if you're just not a well-informed consumer, you just end up making like a really horrible, bad decision for your money. Um, well, so let me know. give you this uh, scenario. Okay. Say if 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 the uh, sixty what six seventy is that what it's called? Yep. What if it goes down in price to eighty seven dollars? How would that change your mentality towards it? Um, I mean, it wouldn't change it a whole lot uh, because, I mean, we're, we're talking about a difference of five, ten bucks between it and, you know, a sale price on a GTS 450. Um, I mean, it, at that point, every ten dollars is, is helping, right? Because you're talking about ten percent of the price of the card. It's, 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 it's really tough. I just did a search, and there's three hundred. At least three hundred graphics cards between fifty and a hundred dollars on Newegg today. Um, yeah, because you know this is obviously <clears throat> just been released, and yep. it's going to be on the high end, just like the GTA X five fifty Ti. Mm-hmm. But in within what two or three weeks, the price of that has gone down another ten bucks. So you have something that's you know ninety percent of the performance of say a GTS four fifty. But it's still another ten bucks cheaper, and it pulls less power, and it's going to create less heat. How how then does that you know you know I'm not trying to play the uh, you know the AMD fanboy, but right. you know, we have in between fifty and one hundred ten bucks such a compressed area of products yeah. and prices and performance range. How exactly do you compete in that, and where do you set your standards as? a professional editor slash reviewer of what no, is a I, good product. What, I mean, when you're talking about five bucks difference is, is going to make a break a thing. Mm-hmm. It's almost impossible. To, it's almost impossible to say something is a bad product because it is so close in comparison to so many other products that you might consider good, better, those types of things. Um, it really does. It, it, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. It's, it's much easier to be a reviewer when things are very clear cut. Um, but when they are, kind of mixed up and, and smashed together in such a way it makes makes purchasing decisions um, much more difficult. And and a lot of times what people don't like to hear is if I say, hey, uh, which is better, you know, the GTS 450 or the HD 5770? And I go, well, unless you're using three monitors, it doesn't really matter. Either is a good choice. right? And sometimes some people don't want to hear that. Other people say, great, that's fine. It takes a lot of weight off of my shoulders. I don't have to worry about if I made a stupid purchasing decision. And I think um, I think that th- this market is, is becoming that. I expect the 6670 and the 6570 to come down, you know, $5, $10 in price, uh, therefore justifying the difference in performance between it and the GTS 450 and that type of thing, um, and the GT 430 as well, which kind of sits – between the 6570 and the 6670, but costs less than both. Uh, it's just, you know, the day that cards come out on the market, you know, that first week, they're at, they're going to be at the retail price, 
AMD and, and their partners and the retailers are going to see what the demand is for it, right? They're not just going to immediately come out and drop prices. Uh, they want to see how things how things go, and uh, I think we're in that point still. Uh, overall, I, I would say these cards are good. Uh, home theater-based PCs, if you've got integrated graphics and you want to upgrade something, one of the things I said is if, you know, AMD touts Ifinity technology on these cards, I, don't, I think gaming on three displays on one of these is kind of a joke. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, but if you want the idea, if you like the idea of having three displays linked up to a single graphics card, it's hard to beat that for, you know, $55 that you can pick up one of these 6570s for. So, you know, just as a uh, <clears throat> an aside, uh, this product, if if you can see it, Yes, it's 20, the HD twenty nine hundred XT, and it has a mm-hmm. total of three hundred and twenty stream shaders. And uh, okay, it's it's about double the bandwidth as as this current card. But when you actually play games, this damn thing pulled uh, what two hundred twenty watts? Oh God, of power! Oh, huge I mean, it was yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was it was huge. And, and now we we have nearly the same amount of power. And, uh, you know, more shading power, less raw power, less uh, actual, uh, you know, memory bandwidth. But overall gaming performance, that this this $99 card is, is going to be very, very comparable. So, I mean, this is just a – it's kind of an interesting thing to see where technology has come in just the past three or four years that you, it's something you hold in your palm like your hand and it won't – burn your hand off like this monstrosity. I don't know. It's it's kind of neat to see, especially it's, at 75 it's watts. See. It's complicated. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about the 60, 60 watts is, is like the max power draw out of these. So definitely, definitely good. Um, let's move on to, uh, I guess, another bit of news here. Josh, you threw something in about a just-delivered MSI GTX 560 <clears throat> Hawk card. Yes, I did. Okay, now this is not the <clears throat> GTX 560 Hawk. No, no this is the original MSI Hawk that they they did out. It was the uh, mm. the dual cooler. You can kind of see two coolers in there behind the shadowy mask. And this was the 5770. It was a great card for the time. I mean, it retailed at like 195 bucks. Now you can pick them up for. 135, if even that. Well, today MSI delivered the next generation of this, and it's the 560 GTX Ti Hawk, and this is a really, really beefy card. I mean, you can't see it very well. No, hard on the silver yeah. stuff, but it's got the uh, it's got the uh, the twin Frozer three design, so it's a a more effective cooler. It's got the voltage uh, measuring points. It's got the dip switches on the back that you can uh, uh, set so that uh, it, it uh, releases all the uh, voltage and uh, uh, other limits, you know, temperature limits of this particular card and chip. So people who are uh, looking for, you know, heavy-duty cooling, uh, being able to tweak their card out to a tremendous amount, this is certainly something that uh, is interesting to see because MSI has has really been on a roll as of late with their video cards, yeah. and I'm I'm testing one out right now that is uh, really impressive on the uh, HD sixty nine seventy side, and I should have that article up probably in the next two days. And uh, you know, I just wanted to uh, be able to show folks uh, what is coming down the line. It's a little bit more affordable. It's in the mid two hundreds range and uh, what you should be able to do with this is nice the the big thing about it is that it's got a a much more robust uh, power delivery system uh, it's an eight plus one type system instead of I think the original had like a three plus one and so you're looking at uh, 113 amps of power. Uh, in a reference design, and this one will deliver 200. And when you're looking at, uh, you know, chips, GPUs that, you know, are uh, they're set at like one volt um, of power and right. sometimes even less than that, when you increase the amperage by that much, 
you could see much better overclocking potential than uh, you would usually consider. So this is a uh, seemingly nice thing. It was delivered today, and I'm excited to test it out because I haven't been able to uh, hammer on in a, uh, a GTX 560 yet. So uh, keep track of this. It looks like uh, MSI is, is really trying to differentiate their products. And uh, even though they are a sponsor and it sounds like I'm <clears throat> being very nice to them, you know, when, when we look at the other offerings from, like, Polygot and, and Galaxy and, and Asus, these really do kind of stand apart when you consider the, the cooling performance, their overall board design, and, and how they address some of the power issues that these, uh, you know, these these high-powered parts really desire and can consume. So... I just wanted to show you guys this. This is going to be on the way in terms of uh, of a review, and, and I'm excited to uh, see what uh, MSI has been able to do with the 560 GTX. Cool. Um, let's go ahead and talk with Alan real quick. Hopefully he has a little bit of background on this. I think Jeremy posted this news on the website uh, the other day, Seagate and Samsung uh, cleverly titled, the, defrag the defragmentation of the storage market continues. I don't know if uh, Jeremy or Alan, you guys want to give the overview of what is going on here? Yeah, I can pipe in a little bit on it. Um, so, yeah, if you think back, what was it, uh, just a few weeks ago, maybe a little over a month ago, we had Western Digital and Hitachi, right? Okay. That was the other combination that happened. So yes. Like, sort of sort of could just see the writing on the wall there that, okay, now you're making like a behemoth over here, so probably the, some of the rest of the guys that are left over are going to make another version of their behemoth. Um, so that happened. Uh, Seagate and Samsung did sort of a combination effort there, throwing around, what was it, a $1.3 billion. Um, no word on sharks with lasers yet. but Right. All right. Um, so where that puts... The hard drive market, actually, is Hitachi and Western Digital together is about 48% of the market. And then Samsung and Seagate together is 40%. And then the last, I think, well, 10 or 8 or whatever percent you want to work that out to is uh, Toshiba and, and uh, Fujitsu, if you count Fujitsu, because that happened like two years ago, Toshiba and Fujitsu merged. That one wasn't really news because those two guys are so small anyway. Um, so now you have six different companies over the past two years that have all sort of conglomerated uh, in their little wings of the market. Uh, Toshiba and Fujitsu really isn't that big. They don't really have a big, you know, they do some OEM stuff anymore. That's about it. So right. what's interesting for this particular merger is actually, if you think back to Western Digital when they acquired Silicon Systems, was that the Sounds SSD? Right. Yeah. Um, they acquired the SSD uh, company like they, that was only tailoring to military before or, or DOD or some kind of that sort of stuff. And then they ended up making one uh, J-Micron-controlled SSD that sort of was a flop. It just really didn't take off. Um, this is different because if you think about it, um, Samsung makes a lot of SSDs like a whole lot, especially when you talk OEMs and um, Apple uses them on a lot of their stuff. Um, and they have the whole solution, right? They make the controller, they make the flash memory, and they make the cache. So they make, front to back, they make their entire SSD. Um, and they're one of the few that do that, right? Because uh, even Intel uses like Hynix or whatever the name of that company is for their, for their, um, for the RAM that's on those SSDs. So Seagate's really or Samsung's really one of the few that are making front to back all the parts to the to their SSD, right? Most importantly, the flash memory itself. Um, so this is news if you consider that with Seagate because Seagate may end up like branding Samsung SSDs, like rebranding them under themselves, or huh. well, they'll be providing of, the flash as well. Uh, yeah, right. And uh, or maybe you might see some kind of I don't want to say hybrid drive, but Maybe a better attempt at a hybrid drive than what Seagate tried, um, you know, a while back, a couple of years back, because that really just didn't do much at all. Um, so there might be some interesting things here, right? So this is so where Western Digital did their little SSD stab. 
that wasn't really a big company. It wasn't a, a huge deal, right? And in that case, well, this uh, we might see Seagate actually be like sort of competitive uh, there as far as solid state drive type of stuff goes or flash memory type of stuff goes. Um, hmm. That's well, sort it kind of, of sounds like thinking. they're going to sell it as Samsung. But they may very well, right? Right, um, and and then but, Seagate is just going to sell the hard drives. Right, but what's really interesting is that if some form of a hybrid comes out of this, and I don't mean hybrid like the the stuff where we, Windows was aware of the hybrid. I mean just like a hard drive with caching built into it that's actually decent caching, mm-hmm. right? That's a uh, flash memory based caching that does a good chunk of the the drive and can hopefully impre- increase the performance. You know, I'd like to see just off the shelf two terabyte drives that you end up getting. You know, maybe ninety percent there as far as SSD kind of performance, because you could probably pull that off if you had a, a good enough flash memory cache and a good enough controller, and a big um, enough one. Uh, yeah, you just you yeah. just need a decent sized cache. You know, maybe twenty, forty, sixty gigs, something like that, because that's what a lot of people are doing now. Except they're just putting their OS on that and they're putting everything else on the big drive. Mm-hmm. If you come up with a good enough caching mechanism and a good enough controller, you could pull it off with just one drive. Um, the only catch is your reliability is limited, of course, by the spinning disk. Spinning disk goes down. The cache isn't really going to save you. You know, the chances are very slim that the cache is just going to happen to have everything that you need to boot back into Windows. Um, so yeah, that would well, sort of be a deal breaker there. You know, no, they use, I mean, some it, companies possible. used to hide that uh, in the BIOS, or, or sorry, they would partition their drive so that there was a little bit of space left to recover you in a horrible situation. True, but I'm talking could, like hard drive failure, like the hard drive. Yeah, so they could probably do that with the flash. Set apart what they, a gig? They could. They could. You could set up a really small partition in there, but I don't. I just don't see it being very user friendly. Like people wouldn't know. You know, the, the average person doesn't even know if they have an OEM style system. They don't even know that the last, you know, ten or twenty gig of their drive is dedicated to uh, OS recovery partition, for example. True. So, yeah, it's, I wouldn't even yeah. count on them trying to market something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I do see some kind of. I, don't, I, I hope to see some kind of a stab at a caching drive come out of this particular merger. Yeah. That would be good. I, I think, well, and what do you think about the, the upcoming, like, technologies that we're, we're hearing about in the Z68? I mean, would that kind of counter it? I'm assuming that you don't have to have an Intel SSD for that. I guess we don't know for sure, but... Uh, that we're, we don't know. We want, we're not going to know until we look at it and get much more info on it because all we have is just sort of uh, this is coming at, at this at this point on that. We know it's coming. Um, and the performance of something like that, uh, I hate to say it, but I think the Z68 solution is going to just slaughter anything that you build onto a drive by itself just because the... Um, is somebody, hold on, hold on. Is somebody eating something? something? No. <clears throat> <laughs> Pulling cards out of staticky wrap. Stop <laughs> eating the chips. Bag things. Yeah. Stop, Stop wrapping eating the hard drive mm, bags. Harvest cheddar sun chips. Mm. Jesus. Um, Where? Yeah. So for so from what I'm seeing on uh, just ICH in general, right? ICH chipsets are really really good when you pair them with SSDs. That driver it just. It's really fast. It pretty much you can get the you know squeeze the best performance possible out of any given SSD with right. that driver and chipset combination. Um, the uh, and that's where I think there's going to be a difference. Um, where Z68 with, paired with a really good SSD as a cache to any whatever spinning disk you put behind it, as long as their driver is implemented right, it, you could you're a lot more flexible with a driver when you're. In, when you're integrating that much with the OS, right? Whereas right. just the just the drive itself sitting on the other side of the serial ATA bus, it, it can only be so good, right? Because your bottleneck is really on that side. Whereas the yeah. you know Z68 could be parallelizing some of those reads, like it could be reading some of the stuff from the solid state drive cache, at, and at the same time, since there's duplicate data on the hard drive, it could be reading from gotcha. that too. Possibly, you know, potentially be doubling throughput when it's you know when it's doing. It could almost treat. Cache data as if that that part of that data was in a RAID one, or even a RAID zero, for example, as if it was mirrored somewhere. Um, so, but that again, that remains to be seen. Uh, but there's just much more potential for a higher bandwidth. But at the same time, um, who's to say that Seagate slash Samsung, if they came out with some kind of merged thing, if that was a six gigabit serial ATA, 
that would make a pretty darn big difference too, right? Because then you you just doubled your throughput. Right. All right. Well, let's talk about a couple of the news posts here. Uh, do we have to? Being, yes, we I do. Mean, really? Are, are we trying to fill up time? Why? Why do we need to talk about news posts? I can. I can. Can we just go to Josh. the end and say, "I'm Ryan Shout. I'm Jeremy Hillstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm Al the Mango no. Montano. The ma- Mango it's Montano. Close. <laughs> it's close. It's close. Sweet. Actually, this is what whatever. happens when we start late. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, um, because yes. Because the beer has already started. It's been a long day. Yes. Uh, real quick, I thought this was kind of cool. Windows 8 to offer OS on a thumb drive portability. This is something I think uh, Linux users have had the pleasure of using uh, for, for years, I guess. The ability to just uh, put your operating system, your settings, your applications on a thumb drive, take it to basically any PC, any hardware, throw it in a USB port. Uh, and boot off of that and have all of your uh, settings and that kind of stuff available. Apparently, Windows 8 is going to have this built into the operating system, uh, and they're calling it a portable workspace. You need at least a 16-gigabyte drive for this to happen. And then it says, there's a quote here from winrumors.com, will ease document compatibility and application feature differences for information workers. They're targeting enterprise customers who have several varied uses for portable versions of Windows. Um, They're talking about it more for diagnosing existing problems on local PC installation, basically having access to all your tools and that kind of stuff to to take a look at the hardware. I think it would be more interesting uh, to think about it as, say, maybe take that OCZ external USB 3.0 hard drive where we're talking about, you know, several hundred megabytes reads and writes, um, at least a couple of hundred either way, and have this be your your main operating system, right, depending on what kind of drivers you need and how Windows is going to handle all the different possible hardware configurations and stuff. It could be pretty cool to see um, to see that in there. And it looks like Windows 8 is going to have some stuff in there other than just ARM support, which uh, will be cool as well. I don't know. Would you guys have use for this? I think I would, especially for quick benchmarking of, of certain hardware pieces, maybe things like that don't require huge driver installs like graphics graphics cards and stuff. But I think I'm, I hope I'm not overstating the feature there. But Most likely you are. But Josh just wants that's... to move on anyway. So let's talk. Uh, did we talk about the <laughs> Intel Micron joint 20 nanometer flash thing last week? We did. No, know. let's move on to me. Stop talking to Alan. I'm the only one who's important here. You I do will disconnect. Talk all the time. Okay, Jeremy's important too because he keeps the money flowing in day by day by posting those news posts and links <laughs> and crap like that. It just keeps but, going and going and going and going and going. Ah, the news it won't finally, stop. somebody appreciates you, and we're still 700 miles away from each other. Yes, I like it that way. Yeah, <laughs> probably better for you know. My STD count. Well, feels, and my liver. Safer. <laughs> wow. So, anyhow. Right. So, into um, so Micron Joint 20 nanometer Flash. Yeah, so uh, I am FT, uh, which is a group, a joint group of Intel and Micron, which they basically just get, put their heads together and have been making Flash memory for the past few years. Um, they are now dropping their process again down to 20 nanometers. So the big deal last uh, February, it was, not this past, although last year, February, um, was that Intel dropped from 34 nanometers all the way down to 25. Now they're dropping further down to 20. Um, And what's usually interesting with a process shrink on flash memory is that you, per die in each package, you will get more capacity. This one does not do that. So this is the first time they've made that step, and it's not a big enough step where they can, like, double the capacity per die. Um, however, it does make a big difference in terms of yield because these dies are not as rectangular. They're more of a square size, which means you can fit a lot more on that wafer. And, right. and so they're talking, like, uh, per wafer. And think about it. Almost everything else is equal when it comes to this stuff. There's, they rework the tools, the, all, the, all the pieces of gear that work a particular wafer, they there might be a, they might add just a couple of steps to the process of actually making, you know, producing that wafer full of dyes. Um, but if you can get like fifty percent more dyes of the same capacity off of one wafer, 
you're, you're talking much better, you know, return on investment, much better potentially, much better yields, uh, that sort of thing. So pretty big deal in terms of not necessarily how much capacity you're going to see on your solid state drive, because with 25 nanometer, we're already seeing SSDs up to like 600 gig without that much of a big deal as, as far as uh, cost per gigabyte, right? It's that the cost per gigabyte stays pretty much the same all the way up to 600 gig now. So that's, that's fine as long as you have enough coin to throw at a 600 gig SSD. Um, but what this difference is going to make is hopefully over time and over a, a faster time than what we thought with just a 25 nanometer push out, uh, even lower cost per gig of flash memory, right? Because if, they're, if their cost is about the same other than just the R&D and, and what went into the process shrink, the actual production cost is probably going to be pretty darn close and, uh, you know, 50% gain in how much you can crank out for that same effort, right? So big, big deal there potentially for uh, getting SSDs into more people's hands and into more markets and that sort of thing. Um, now, the, uh, the die is a little bit smaller, just uh, like lengthwise. Um, it's still, you, they're still going to put them in the same kind of package, so that's sort of a moot point. They're still stacking them, you know, the typical how many they could stack inside a package, um, which they usually shoot for like four dies in a package. They can go eight, but once you go up high, that high, you start getting diminishing returns on yields because they have to package them together and then test it. And so if one of those eight failed during production, then you won't know until the end, so you just threw away seven good ones. Um, so they usually try not to go more than, than four high. Um, the... Uh, what was the other part of the big deal here? Okay, so something they snuck in at the end of the announcement is that they're talking about uh, coming out with a die like that would be longer, probably too long to fit in a standard uh, a standard um, TSOP TSOP package. Yeah, um, it wouldn't fit in there, so they might have to come up with some kind of different packaging, maybe a little bit different uh, dimensions on it, um, maybe like a BGA kind of mount thing that they would use for mobile market, you know, cell phones, that kind of thing. Um, what would end up happening is instead of 8 gigabytes for that one, you know, that one die, you get 16. So you could actually get a double, you know, doubling of capacity, but just this wasn't enough of a step for them to squeeze it in that same TSOP. Um, hmm. But it is interesting for the mobile market because you could take uh, one of those dies could be 16 gig, they could potentially stack up to eight within that new style of package, whatever it may be. So you're talking 128 gig on one chip, like one physical chip. So that's like a 128 gig solid state drive for all intents and purposes, all crammed huh. on the one chip. Um, and especially since it, it, you know, and I know you're thinking, okay, just one chip. Well, what's the deal there? Because it's, you know, SSDs need to be parallel. They need to talk to a bunch of chips at once. If they use the, the newest version of Onfi, the actual standard for communicating data, you're talking like 200 meg per second, 400 meg per second transfer rates just from one chip. Um, maybe not that as high IOs per second as like your fire-breathing 10-channel Intel SSD, but um, definitely have really high throughput. Definitely something you could squeeze into even like a, a, a notebook, laptop kind of thing and still get plenty of good performance out of um, but, you know, who's, who knows? That's just something they're talking about on the on the horizon. And they say that that solution would be smaller than a postage stamp. So they might, instead of just making it longer, they might just make it wider um, and just make it like a bigger square, something that couldn't fit in a relatively <laughs> narrow TSOP. So interesting stuff there um, that's, that's coming from this, this particular die shrink. Um, something else that was very interesting that came out on a conference call I listened in on about this uh, release is some numbers that I know people that tend to dive into this a lot like me and just are out of morbid curiosity for like SSD longevity. Uh, some numbers got thrown around there that were really interesting to me. So we know that, uh, think back to like the original Intel SSDs, 34 nanometer. That's back when everybody was saying that SLC is 100,000 read-write cycles, MLC is 10,000, right? Those are the right. numbers that everybody threw around, right? There's doomsday. The doomsday, well, the, okay. So <clears throat> the theory or the working theory or just the sort of just the hard limit that just what you have to deal with physically is that as you shrink the dies here, there's less material in each flash cell. So you're probably going to burn it out sooner. What I learned during that conference call that was interesting to me was that uh, when you do uh, die shrinks on CPUs or GPUs, for example, um, 
all you get in, is like as, as far as how you're cranking these things out is just a yield, right? How many good dyes right. do you get per wafer? So either sure. it works or it doesn't, right? Right. Um, flash memory sort of is the same way. It works or it doesn't, and there's yields and that sort of thing. And as they tune the process, the yields get better And as far as how many come out off the line working. But the difference is that your typical CPU or GPU doesn't burn out over any time that you're probably going to be using it. I mean, I can't remember the last time I just had a CPU or a GPU just brick itself right you know, after like a couple of years of use, right? Um, Except, of course, if <clears throat> Ken sticks his fingers into fans. True, yes. But that's actually, a that, whole actually, other that, conversation that whatsoever. That's actually... That card actually still works. It's spinning right now on the test bed. Um, but so for flash memory, as they tune their process over a period of like months or up to a year after they've started that process, they actually get better cycles out of, out of, out of that given flash. So not only are you getting better yield, but for that yield, you're actually getting like, okay, on average, this flash memory, it's not maybe just 3K cycles. Like they might rate it for 3,000 cycles for, for 25 nanometer. But what they actually start seeing is like 5,000. So what they were talking about during this conference call was for 20 nanometer, they ex Intel and Micron expect to be able to get that up probably close to 5,000. Maybe not rated for 5,000, but what you actually get out of it is 5,000. So it's interesting to see that they did this much of a shrink, two layers in on shrink, and they're hoping to hit a mark that's only uh, you know, half of the cycles of what, what originally came out as 34 nanometer. Back in you know with the original Intel SSDs and the original Intel flash memory, so uh, it's interesting to see those numbers being thrown around and the fact that the the longer the, the they, they have to mature the process, the better they're going to get. So that's actually why you know it was last February we saw 25 nanometer being produced. I actually saw it myself, but we haven't really seen it come out on the market until now because they were maturing that process, getting it where it really needed to be for it to last as long as it needed to for uh, like a consumer application. Right, so same thing is going to happen with this twenty nanometer stuff. Most likely, you're not. It's yes, they're making it now. You're not going to see an SSD with it. Sure, you know, next week you're going right. to probably see an SSD with it. Um, I want to say next year, right? Okay. Um, but yeah, really interesting stuff that was coming out there that I figured I'd get out there to cool. our listeners. Um, another qu quick interesting thing is, uh, if you work at Intel or Apple, you probably got a bonus, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I would, Apple had like six billion dollars in profits, and what was Intel's? Something like uh, twelve point eight billion in revenue, and something yeah. like three point eight billion in net. So, uh, other words, uh, or did they get? Yeah, them? the actual. Yeah, the actual uh, <laughs> numbers are twelve point eight billion in revenue and net income for Intel. Was well, three point two billion. Now, part of this is offset by some of their acquisitions, which was that wireless company as well as McAfee. But still, when you consider that they uh, did not sell as many Sandy Bridge parts as they possibly could, and they took a big old uh, mm, hit with this eight sixty seven and P sixty seven chipset issue, right? They've done very, oh, yeah, very yeah. well. Yeah, their their margins went down from what last quarter to this quarter, like two or three percent. So they're at you know at the horrific sixty one percent margin <clears throat> number, which uh, many people and many companies would kill for. Intel has done very very well. So when you consider how much of a hit they did take with this whole Sandy Bridge issue, and how much uh, you know extra volume of money that AMD took from them, which was apparently fairly significant, but still not significant enough to make AMD be, you know, the big man on Silicon Campus. Right. Intel has done very, very well for this quarter. And, uh, Boy, you know, usually second quarter of the year is, is one of the worst. Q1 is pretty bad. Q2 can be either a little better or much, much worse. As yeah, but Q1 for saving... them broke records this year. Oh, boy. Q1 like, broke Q1 records. Was just... Q2 broke records. So, I mean, it was yeah. – it was. well, no, I'm sorry. Q1 is, is now their official because they had to change around uh, to match their calendar year. 
they actually had like two weeks less in their Q1 that they usually have. And so, I mean, it was pretty outstanding for uh, for Intel. And uh, Apple, of course, uh, they, they, they kind of overshadowed them because uh, Q2 of Apple of, of this year – was revenue of twenty four point six seven billion, which makes Steve Jobs and his cronies very, very happy. And they makes had a net me happy too. Profit. I couldn't be happier for them. Really? Are are you an investor in in Apple stock? No, I wouldn't want to buy in when I was uh, able to purchase it anyway. So. Yeah, well, you really wanted to buy around nineteen ninety six, ninety seven. <laughs> yeah. Of course, came in. The things were on the down, but boy, they and weather through kicking. Steve going away, yeah, and then yeah, coming and back, that, they're, they're absolutely kicking that pig. The net profit was uh, five point nine nine billion, so basically they're they're doubling what Intel has. I mean, Intel is one of the largest semiconductor manufacturers in the world. They have more fab space than any one singular entity in the world. But still, they they can't overcome what Apple, that little Cupertino damn company, is able to do now. Profit sure, margin. this is all this is all done on the bodies of all the Foxconn workers that you know have piled up in the streets from the tall buildings. But regardless, regardless, uh, semiconductor industry is not nearly as bad off as many people were expecting it to be and uh you know intel and apple are are really two big bellwethers for for the industry and both have done very very well in the first half of this year and so that seems like both consumers and industry and you know many companies are buying a lot more tech infrastructure than we were expecting at this time so amd's probably gonna have some some uh, good results uh, you know, guys like T.I., uh, you know, the folks who make the Snapdragon, you know, all, all of this technology buying is has just really accelerated this year. And I think we're going to see a lot of uh, really good results from a lot of tech companies that at least know what they're doing. So, you know, AMD, they're going to see probably a jump what they would expect from Q2. I mean, it's not going to be overwhelming, but, I mean, they, they are going to have a profit there. And, uh, you know, whether or not they gain market share, they probably will have a couple of points. But, boy, the industry is is just booming, and that's really surprising when you consider, uh, you know, the, the problems of Japan. You know, we have a new war in, in Libya. Right. All these other intangibles that are that are really affecting our industry uh boy things are still just really going strong and that's that's surprising but good news guys um speaking of good news let's get into some emails or at least we got a couple of them here uh since we're running a little bit late not too late but a little bit late uh podcast at pcper.com email us there we will uh hopefully be able to get to your questions 1888 pc per toll free in the US and Canada those uh email addresses and telephone numbers still exist so um let's take the first one here uh i guess i'll go ahead and read this one here this is it's from Graham asking about thunderbolt gpus so what do you guys think of the possibility of an external graphics card enclosure that connects a notebook computer via Intel's Thunderbolt? Would it be fast enough to play any recent computer games? Would a high-end external desktop class graphics card connected via Thunderbolt be able to outperform the high-end discrete notebook graphics cards? Uh, by my calculations, he says, Thunderbolt speed is 10 gigabytes, 10 gigabits per second, or 100. Uh, I'm going to skip all that. Um, the next, he said, basically, ten gigabits per second, um, five gigabytes per second, and if we look at the gigabytes per second of PCI Express, basically, um, it only takes four lanes of PCI Express 2.0 to surpass Thunderbolt's bandwidth. Actually, it only takes three lanes to bypass Thunderbolt's speed. So. That's interesting to point out. Um, I, I do think that external graphics card enclosures are possible. They've been possible since um, Express Card slots. We've seen them demoed 
at least three years in a row at Computex and CES and things like that. Um, it's it's something that is it, it's capable of being done. I guess the issue is is there a market for it? Is there enough of market there for people to build up? Um, you know, enough units to make this a reasonable cost thing. I think Asus had one that I was almost sure was actually going to be released. MSI has had one as well. Gigabyte has had one as well. Um, and I don't think that there's a performance problem there, although I think Thunderbolt with its PCI Express integration where it's it's all it, it appears to be directly connected to the system um, might help some of the hardware issues. I don't think that was the the main issue. The main issue was financial feasibility for external item like this. Um, I don't think it would be able to outperform high-end discrete notebook graphics cards. Direct connection is always going to be faster there. Um, I assume they have at least four lanes of PCI Express, probably more going to any kind of discrete graphics cards there. Um, so while possible, um, we haven't seen Thunderbolt really on any major super awesome uptake anyway, so who knows at this point. Jeremy, you want to take our second email from Jeff? Well, Jeff has a question about PC case fans. Uh, but first, a public service announcement. Hey, Josh, I'm interested hey, in what? renting some advertising. Mainly, for some reason, uh, he's a little delusional, but he wants the San Jose Sharks logo, or Go Sharks, to be painted on your head during the stream during the NHL playoffs. Please get back to him with terms and the willingness to do so. Hopefully you know, he's... everything has a price, including <laughs> my head. And Josh's is usually pretty low. Yeah, I'm easy. Eh, when he makes Sorry. an offer, I'll make a counter offer for the Habs. Oh, but okay. he's got an Antac 1200 case, and he hates the crap out of it just because it's so difficult to plug in the SATA cables when they're rotated parallel with the board variety. Uh, so he's got one of those ones where they're stuck in the corner there. Uh, mm. And the inability to change the fans due to the proprietary controller wiring built into the case. Really? Mm. I haven't played with an Antec 1200. Uh, when you guys take a look at cases, do you swap fans in order to see how easy or difficult it is to do so? I get the feeling that nearly everyone who builds a PC is going to need a sw to swap a fan, and some of these designs just make it impossible. Uh, I met these nifty little rubber replacements for the screws, which just makes switching fans so easy. Because if most of the other screws on a PC are pretty forgiving, if you swap them around, you know, don't mess up the motherboard, though, because it gets right. short-tempered. Uh, but, you know, the fans, if you don't put the right screw in, it rattles, it swings, it eventually falls off and tries to take components with it. But the little rubber things are not bad. I mean, proprietary controller wiring, well, either it's got two wires or three wires. Yeah, as you say, I don't know how proprietary it is. You can yeah. always snip it. Yeah, I mean, if there's a PWM on it, if you've got a fan controller on it, you need three wires. Other than that, positive and negative, and you're laughing. So I don't know what... Well, I've seen it before. Okay. <sighs> so, yeah, I mean, I don't tend to do case reviews, but I do tend to swap fans out because, yeah. well, frankly, LED fans annoy the hell out of me. I don't want strobing things, so I go and I buy something with a serious <laughs> amount uh, of <laughs> able to move a lot of volume of air, of able to do it relatively quietly, and I have a nice collection of LED fans that one day I'm going to do something with, I'm sure. I'm sure. You're well. all about strobing, Jeremy. Oh. Alan, we have uh, one more email from Paul if you want to grab that one. Sure. You have an email from Paul about rusty graphics cards. Not rusty <laughs> as in Josh, but rusty as in graphics cards. All right. No, I'm crusty. Come on, get it right. Oh, crap. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, so Paul. Paul has an issue with the video card he received today from an eBay purchase. Sapphire Radeon 6870 that he got for, was that Australian dollars? Uh, 150 yep. bucks. Uh, which I thought was a good deal until I saw rust on a couple of screws and on the display outputs. Needless to say, I'm angry, and I expect the vendor to provide me with a refund. However, would there be a way of sufficiently cleaning the rust and ensuring no further corrosion? 
If so, then I want to keep and use it. If not, or if it's too risky, then send it back and buy a new one. So, um, it, don't don't like radi- radions, and I mean the screws. That's not a big deal. But on the outputs, usually those contacts are like gold or some sort of plated to begin with. So if it got like left in weather bad and long, long enough to eat through that plating, then it's sort of a gamble. I mean. As long well, as is he not... talking about the interior connection, or is he talking about like, like the silver there on the connections, like on the outside? Like, no, he said on the display outputs, and I'm assuming he means like the pins, or if if there was enough corrosion for it to corrode the outside, chances are the pins are corroded too, or the contactors are corroded too on the inside. Uh, mm. Actually, that's a good point, though. I mean, it is possible that, that that stuff on the outside isn't really plated for any kind of corrosion protection or exactly. better, better conduction. That's what I would have anyway. thought would have done so, first. And then by screws, I assume he means whatever is holding the fan and heat sink on in the back of right. the graphics. So the screws, that's not a big deal. Uh, most of the board's going to have conformal coating on it anyway, so that's fine. Uh, the PCI Express slot connectors are gold-plated, so they probably didn't do anything as far as corrosion. That should have been pretty you know, weather-resistant if the card got left out or something like that. Funky happened before he got it. Um, so if it's just that, sh- that metal shield, uh, shroud part of the connector, um, on the outer perimeter of it, you're fine. Just clean it up the best you can or something like that. Unless it's just rust pouring off of the thing, but I doubt it's that bad. Um, but look at the actual pins. So if the pins or the, the contacts in there are, you know, they should be plated as well. They're usually gold plated. Um, so is, they should look clean. Uh, and if they do, then, yeah, you should be just fine using that board, as long as the board actually works, which I assume it does from the, the tone of his email. Sounds like he tried to fire it up. I don't know. Yeah. I'd give it a shot, though. I mean, it's you know, if it was a deal and there's only, like, a little bit of corrosion on parts that don't really matter, no, nah, I'd use it. Uh, on a guess, 150 Australian for a 6870, yeah, that was a deal. Yeah. And it, just because it sat outside on the beach for three weeks doesn't mean it's broken. Yeah, in you know. the ocean. <laughs> all right, all uh, frozen stops eventually. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, again, email address, podcast at pcper.com. Please send us your questions, comments, uh, thoughts, curses, whatever you need. Let's get into hardware software picks of the week. We'll run through these pretty quick. Um, I was going to pick what Jeremy was going to pick, but he wrote it down first. Um, so with that, I will um, <laughs> I will simply go with the new site. Uh, Drupal as a content management system is incredibly powerful. It can, can be a pain in the butt if anybody's used it. Uh, but it's also incredibly powerful, the amount of things we were able to edit and change and 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 install in the last day or so after seeing things go live and how things are reacting has been has been pretty impressive. Um, so if you're looking for a content management system to run on your own servers, uh, take, take a look at Drupal, D-R-U-P-A-L, very powerful. Uh, a lot of big sites are using it now. The Onion, actually, is probably the biggest site uh, that I know of that is actually using Drupal. I think one of the White House uh, sites was, or the Obama site when uh during all that was was using it as well so that is my software pick and now uh jeremy your pick is this well is a i triumph. got it on a tuesday jeremy's making a note here huge success go on huge i success. can't <laughs> Neither can I. I haven't seen very much of it, but it came out Tuesday. Couldn't do anything with it because, well, the Habs are playing. Wednesday, well, it was the Canucks. And so today I finally got my first look at Portal 2. Yep. It's been a long time since I've played a game that just sort of says, you know, here you go. Have fun. They don't walk you through, this is how you do this. This is your gun. This is your weapon. Uh, but it's, I, it's really been a lot of fun. They take the humor of the first one and continue it on. You know, the, the liberation field will free you of any unauthorized weapons. Managed to Including your the air canals. Of course. Uh, you know, uh, no, it's yeah. not wet back there. Um and I've got a chance to look at one of the extra movies, which introduces the two robots that you will be in the uh, cooperative mode. 
and right. was just giggling madly. Yeah, I I played like the first thirty minutes of the game uh, yesterday, the day before, and it was it's the dialogue and the humor is just as well made in this version as it was in the first game. It's it, it is pretty funny. And just for those interested, if you don't happen to have downloaded it yet and you just want like a little bit of a taste, there's a thing on G4. It's like a first fifteen. They have a Portal Two version of the first fifteen. It's like basically the first fifteen minutes of play through the game, so you can just like uh, watch and see what the intro and that sort of thing looks like before you jump on it. Which, of course, yeah. maybe you want to play but, it ten times worse, but I just don't have enough time right now. <laughs> yeah, no, that's but apparently well. the timer is a lie. The timer it gives you a lie. timer as to how long it takes you to go through uh, the game, and so you got some people coming in at like twenty minutes for their total play time. The whole guys, game, three or four hours. Most people are saying about seven or eight. So either there's a director in the background not letting you play a bunch of the game, or the Steam timer that sort of says it took you this yeah, long. Yeah, that sounds like it's broke. That's worked. Sounds the like the timer it's broke. is a lie. Josh, Josh so sounds, it sounds like you you have a game for us as well. You know, <clears throat> uh, when I was testing this lightning card, I decided to. Uh, See what I could do to make an older title still stress out something like this. And I got on to Oblivion again. It's a great game. I've only played a certain amount, but all the other people that I know who have played through it uh, just rave about it. And you can do all kinds of mods and interesting things with the graphics to make it look even better than it does, and it still looks really good. So... You know, hmm. for uh, you know, either nineteen or twenty six bucks, and you can mod the heck out of it, and have a game that's just as good as uh, you know, a fifty or sixty dollar game that we can buy today. You'll have many, many, many hours of enjoyment. And again, yeah, I've I've I've, I've been working on it this week. Not so much game playing, but tweaking the images and. Uh, and the graphics and, uh, you know, throwing in a couple mods to uh, really expand on uh, the parallax shaders that are uh, involved in the game. Huh. You know, it's, it, it looks a lot better. And, uh, boy, you know, it's it's going to stress out the, uh, the computer that you have if you apply all the stuff that really gets up to date. Hmm. Cool. All right. Uh, last on our list, Alan. What do you got? All right, so uh, actually, right before that pick, uh, to revisit my thing from last week, my anti-pick, you can actually update your iOS now because they fixed that little battery drain <laughs> thing. So uh, 4.3.2 actually fixed it. So, like, I don't know, I guess three-quarters of the people that had issues with 4.3, and then, like, the other quarter of them had issues with 4.3.1. So 4.3.2 fixes it. And I, it's, I, I specifically, like, didn't mess with my phone like from the prior settings, like I tried all those things that were on forums to try to supposedly fix the problem, and then right. I was like, okay, fine. And I just restored the whole phone from backup to put it right back, right back where it was. And so just going from that where I had the issue and had my prior settings from like, I don't know, iOS 2 dot something that's been carrying over for like ever now, um, those same settings, no issues. So all those forum posts about do this, do that, and hold your left ankle over your head, and this will <laughs> fix the issue. No. So... uh and just, like, to give an example, today's use, it's, like, four and a half hours of use and eight hours of standby, and I'm at half battery. So, yes, definitely no problems on that. Um, on to the pick. Uh, and this is actually, for once, something that I found cheaper locally than I could find online. Uh, right. So I figured, what the heck. Um, so I'm at Lowe's picking up tools to fix up the house or whatever, and I see this little mini... Uh, power screwdriver, like two AAA battery powered, and it's got the, you know, the number zero, one, and two, uh, Phillips, and you know, like all your little cell phone opening style bits, right. like the really huh. tiny screwdriver bits, right? Um, things that you usually buy in a jeweler screwdriver set, so you, so you can work on your really small computer parts. But this thing is like a size of a pen, maybe a little bit thicker, like a kind of like triple a flashlight size thing and uh it's a power screwdriver so it's actually like actually has like a little tiny motor in there and it's actually <laughs> it's the thing works just really well just like surprisingly well you just hold it just like it's a pen and you just slide the 
thing with your How thumb. How much did you pay for it? it? Okay, so it was I, I found it at Lowe's. It was 20 bucks, And, like, okay. it's on Amazon for, like, 22 or 21 So it's, like, yeah. more expensive than it was just right down the street. Um, so, yeah, and it's actually pretty torquey. Like, it's I, – I could probably put – this could probably <laughs> drive something with more torque than, like, if you had the regular uh, – just the steel – body jeweler screwdriver that you usually like tear up your fingers trying to trying to loosen something with this actually does like better than that uh and that's under the motor power just by itself it's actually like like you know if you hold hold the thing down and make it so it's yeah. like actually trying to trying to work yeah it's just it's worked on everything so far so it's if you want to that can be nice not to not tear up your hands like uh doing that work on that laptop or whatever it is you happen to be working on it's pretty good for 20 bucks Heck, I should have bought that a long time ago. Indeed, indeed. And in fact, yep. oh, it's called the uh, it's called the General Tools Power Precision Screwdriver. Yes, don't forget we are an audio podcast. Always. Yes. All right, that's going to wrap up the show for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, again, I encourage everybody to go to the new PC Perspective website at pcper.com. You can still find the uh, information about the show at pcper.com slash podcast i apologize right after the right after the site launched um we kind of moved everything and moved in a whole bunch of new stuff and the rss feeds were broken uh for the podcast that was fixed fairly shortly thereafter uh you can of course find us twitter.com slash pc per facebook.com slash pc per we'd love to see you uh join up with us and and, and uh learn all about pc perspective when we post our new stuff on those particular sites uh, but that's going to be it I'm Ryan Schrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Al Alventano. Now it's time Thanks. to play Portal 2. Yeah, there you go. 